Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is my favorite part of AFM conference, my personal favorite part, because it melds together two of my favorite three things. FM, Black Feminist Kiljo Reading Group, and um, the Art on Our Mind project, which I'll tell you about. I do have other loves that are not related to any of these things, uh, because I'm a very complicated person, uh, otherwise known as human. So uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to this Art on Our Mind uh, Creative dialogue with artist Mary Savande. Yeah. And um, I've been looking forward to this for a really, really long time. And so I am uh, really grateful to Mary for making time to come out all the way to Makanda here. Um, it is a real privilege to be able to have a conversation with you. Uh, joining me in this conversation is uh, Londiwe Mshali, who's part of the FM's team, and an MA uh, study current, currently doing her MA in Fine Arts at Wits University, and uh, Nono Matloki, who is an independent visual artist uh, based in Johannesburg, but coming from Pretoria. Um, so uh, I, I was really moved by, uh, is it non policies uh, um, you know what she said about coming from a township because uh, I mean I come from a township as well and uh, in Durban and for me visual arts was always um, an avenue out of that just like books were um, I found myself in artworks and in um, books you know artworks grounded me books took me out of that confines of the township. But it really was when I encountered um, Bell Hooks' art on our mind that I started to understand, because for me that was, it was completely groundbreaking. Of course, it doesn't matter how late you come to something. <laughs> if it's groundbreaking for you, it's groundbreaking. Yeah. But Bell Hooks' work was fundamental in speaking back to how important representationality is has been uh, the, the power of representational life and death and who has that power. Um, but also the kinds of critical essays that she looks at photography, she looks at visual arts, she's looking also at the intersections of with popular culture in that book, speaking back to the importance of, importance of that in terms of how we represent ourselves, how we see ourselves, what causes us to uh, feel apart also from certain genres. Because even though I had art at school, uh, it was only after I, like, you know, sort of came to Wits University for my second MA, I realized how elitist <laughs> fine arts were. Mm -hmm. um, because you know, up until that part, you know, you go to Durban Art, uh, the the Durban City Hall. <coughs> Downstairs is the library. The second floor is a natural history museum. Uh, on the third floor is the art gallery space. And there's a big dinosaur that's going through all three floors. <laughs> Loved it. You know, you take those things for granted because you can walk up the stairs. There's nobody, there's no gatekeepers. And then once you sort of start to get into the field itself, you understand the kind of the elitism, uh, the gatekeeping that's fundamentally involved in something that, that is colonially called fine arts. Mm -hmm. But which we don't, we kind of avoid that word because... I think more of creativities, and that's what these amazing scholars have opened up for me, that we've always been involved in creativities. And so nobody has ownership of creativity uh, and creativities because it's a fundamental human trait. Um, and so out of that um, was born this, uh, when I finally got some funding from, from the NRF a few years ago, was born this project that's called uh, Art on Our Mind. Um, and that is because we have some of the most amazing visual artists in the world. I mean, the same with literary, the same with the musical field, the same with the, the theater, same with the poets. I mean, we kind of have them on tap. But discourse has been lagging. You know, too often discourse is written on black women, uh, creatives, 
tend to be autobiographical, mm -hmm. right? There's nothing wrong with the autobi uh, with autobiography because we come to see how the kinds of the intersecting uh, politics that make us who we are and how we can operate. But it can't be the be all and end all. And so art in our mind has been created in order to have sort of in-depth discussions uh, with South African women uh, creatives, most uh, especially um, visual artists. And uh, we want to solicit information about the artist herself, uh, her inspirations, her working methodologies. Um, we'll ask her things about her favorite color. <laughs> <laughs> Very difficult question for an artist. Um, and of course, we will also have an opportunity to ask questions um, to the artist herself. Um, and we actually have a platform, just like we have a whole AFM's archive that you've heard is helping love lives, and we yeah. applaud that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but also in terms of, you know, just documenting the amazing, even if it's somebody's first presentation, there's just, that first presentation is just awesome. <laughs> and so we've always been moved by that uh, in AFM's. And the same thing with the art on our mind, we have an online platform. The research team is involved, and Chloe uh, Shane is not here, but she's been doing a lot of the research. And Mary, it's online. Uh, we basically, uh, you know, try to find as much secondary research as we can on the artist that we are going to be interviewing. We then put that online along with this conversation, which is soliciting primary information. And what we want is that whether it's a kid in. Um, in the Cape Flats, because I get a lot of queries from Cape kids in the Cape Flats for information, which is really fantastic. I don't know what's happening there, but big ups to them. And or whether it's a you know a seasoned researcher, they can find as much information in one space as possible to encourage research uh, on these amazing artists. So. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, I might be switching into my art on my mind voice, um, because I do have a very townshipy voice. It took me many, many years to learn the word film as opposed to flim. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Nona says that I have an interview voice, apparently. So I might be switching in, into that at some point. I'm a little sure you so, welcome, Mary, thank you. Thank to AFEMS 2023 and to the Art on Our Mind uh, Research Project. Um, thank you for engaging with us this last few months as well um, around your work. And um, so I'm going to start off simple question. Uh, where were you born and what do you, did your parents do for a living? Um, I was born in Babaton, which is a small town. Um, it's a five-hour drive from Joburg. Um, so that's in Bumalanga, um, not far from Nelspreet. Um, from from zero years old up to three years old, I was um, living with my parents, and at some point, my dad left. Um, he was called out to be in the army, South African army. So this was nineteen eighty three, um, and then he disappeared, <laughs> and he showed up when I was sixteen. Um, my mother at some point had to get a job and she um, she became a domestic worker and then at some point she moved to Joburg and she worked at a hair salon um, and at some point she opened up a small business and that's how I was able to go to university to be the first in the family. <laughs> and I think even within this room, even though we talk about intergenerational stuff, it's still quite a few people who can identify right with being the first person in your family to go to university and all that that means. Yeah. The really great stuff but also the burdens. Mm -hmm. so. so where did you go to school and um, what influence uh, did the kind of uh, primary or secondary uh, education that you had, uh, what influence did that have on, on your perceptions of art or your access to art? Um, up to, from, from grade one up to grade six, I was in a uh, township school 
And then um, grade six, I went to an African school. So remember, this is Babaton, small town, mm -hmm. Africans. Really, when I say Africans, I mean it in every angle that you can think of. Yeah. Um, and um, there was no art in, in my school. Um, at some point, actually, I wanted to be a fashion designer. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, I landed or was pushed, or the universe pushed me into fine art. Um, I always say that the universe will always make a decision on your behalf. Mm -hmm. And it's just one of those decisions where, you know, like now, now that I'm looking back, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. And it felt like I was at the right space at the right time. Um, yeah. Um, in and around your home, your family, um, home, home, or home, <laughs> what kind of creativities did you grow up with? And creativity is in an expanded sense. Mm. Actually, I used to watch a lot of soapies. <laughs> I think that's where in my head, you know, like mm -hmm. dreaming and just creating other worlds in my head started. Um, and I think that came in handy later when I started um, uh, uh, experimenting with photography because um, I was both the actor, the director, and the cine cinematographer at the same time. So that came in handy. You know, Stephen away, he like he would die like twenty million times in like five years. Um, oh, what else did I do? I didn't play. I didn't go out. I was just. In an indoor person, um, grew up in my grandparents' home because my mom at some point moved to Joburg. Um, used to I used to make things with my with my hands. I used to draw a lot. I uh, used to buy clay and make dogs, which is funny. Like five, fast forward a few years later, now I'm making these life size dogs, which we'll later talk about. Yeah, yeah I, th I think there has to be a lot more scholarship done on days of our lives, right? <laughs> I promise you, papers must be right? papers must be written out of out of these soapies. Yeah, because I mean that was my first introduction to critical thinking was my mother watching these soap operas and she would say she said come see here come see here and I'd be like what she says John Black has been running past the same tree three times <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which, yeah. Is, which is so unlike my, my aunts yeah. you know like going and visiting them and they'd be talking about and I think they were talking about a neighbor and for half an hour Sammy did this and Sammy did that and then, then I was like Oh, Sammy and days of our lives. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we were talking about the whole time. Yeah. So yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm really glad that you made that reference. <laughs> you went to Technic Pond, Johannesburg. Yes. Um, how did this experience at this Technic Pond set up your skills mm -hmm. for your career later on? Um, so when um in 2001 when i started when i did my first year it was yeah it was a technicon mm -hmm. so um so mostly it was just about think of an idea mm -hmm. and then create it with your own hands so we were taught to make things mm -hmm. so that's why you can lock me up in a room and say make a dog i'll make it mm -hmm. weld something i'll do it so we did everything from clay to casting silicone to working with brown bar um, and I think that's where I got my skills, you know, like um, um, the, the ability to make stuff with my hands started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, of course, later it became UJ, where now it's funny because when it started, it was a technicon. By the end, when I got to my fourth year, it was a university. Mm -hmm. So now the change was actually, we were part of the change where now we were actually like, come down enough with your hands, now think. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so it was a it was a very interesting process, and I think um, that, that there's been a a lot of um, actually there are a lot of a few artists that were in my class that are actually practicing to this day. Because usually with fine art um, students, you know, they just go they go to other careers and etc. But in my class, I can name a few. There's Lawrence Lemawana, there's Sabem Julie, there is um, Michelle Harris. There's Lerato, uh, Lerato Shadi, who, who, who else am I forgetting? They actually are practicing right now. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe that shift, we were part of that, you know, like the, the change that was happening in the, in the varsity. I think it, it enabled us to actually stick around and make art. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
That's really awesome. Um, so, as you were reflecting on your shift um, from the university days, yeah. you later became an art world sensation <laughs> and quite an amazing sensation um, with your sculptural uh, character, Sophie. Yeah. How did um, you come up with the idea of Sophie and can you speak to the different choices um, that you made when crafting this character, um, anything, honestly? Mm -hmm. um, it kind of started um, like a, a play, <laughs> or I wanted to write down the idea in a script manner, but of course at that time, um, it was just writing ideas. I didn't know how to write a script because mm -hmm. I, I think there are formulas on how to actually write a script. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I remember one of my lecturers um, said, well, if you don't have a concept, tell us your story. Tell us your, where, where do you come from? Mm -hmm. I was like, geez, where do I come from? How did I end up in Joburg? Mm -hmm. um, and then I remember it was a, a, a few months later, I went to visit my grandmother. So I went back to Barberton. I was just talking. My grandmother was like, what is this art that you're doing? So you guys throw the whole day. <laughs> um, and of course, think about it. It's like in, in this small town, there were no, no galleries, no art centers. Um, so art was just a foreign thing that I was doing in Joe work. And at this, at some point I didn't have answers actually for my family members. Um, but it, it, it's, as, as time went, um, I had a language so started showing them that this is what I'm doing. And of course, I think with other with extended family members, it started clicking when they started seeing me on TV. Yeah. Uh, but also that comes also with a burden. So I stopped doing, um, television because yeah. now people are thinking that you're rich the neighbors yeah. now are thinking like oh my god you're rich. <laughs> um, so it, it came with that and of course we've been the first of everything i'm the oldest and when it comes to my grandmother's um grandkids um there's six of us um so like they're all looking up to me so there was also that pressure and at the same time i was also pressured that i need to do well i need to economically i need to survive this art and um at some point we just became like well, it was too much mm -hmm. and at the same time i started traveling and of course as soon as you go oh i was in switzerland like ah mm -hmm. switzerland okay mm -hmm. i was in germany so um so it came with, with with that so and that's how it started like um i just interviewed my grandmother i was like how how's your life how was your life mm -hmm. and she's like what do you mean it's like I, I, i'm writing down a story like tell tell me about you and um, what clicked was she didn't tell me what she was doing. She told me what she wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was the, that was for me, that was the birth of Sophie. I was like, I, I want to tell a story about something that will never happen. Um, I want to tell a story about um, something that, so, a, a wish, and hence the eyes are closed all the time, denying reality, being in the space, being inward, mm -hmm. um, not making eye contact with anyone, because as soon as you engage with the outside world, then you have to take in whatever the, whatever the viewer or person is giving you. Mm -hmm. So she's in her own world creating whatever she's creating. Um, you see that with, with the comments, you see with the props that, um, and then especially with this work right here, I was, um, so my studio at that time was um, at August House. Um, and there were a lot of um, Zionist churches around there. I think there were about six. Um, so every Sunday, we just used to see like these, um, these church goers wearing um, um, the, the, the Zionist uniform all stitched up. And um, what I also attracted, what attracted me to their fashion was they regard themselves as, um, as soldiers of God. So mm -hmm. I like that part. And I wanted to take that. Um, I, and of course, I, I grew up in a um, very Christian um, household. So I wanted to take Christianity and marry it with um, my own kind of thinking now. I'm, I'm living in the city, so this urban way of looking at life. And at the same time, combine it with 
my all time love, which is fashion. So this 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 um this what do you call it? this cross is is covered in um, Louis Vuitton prints. So that was me tapping into. So this is actually the first um, body of work. This was two thousand and. Um, 2009 and just right after varsity so um so you can still kind of pick up the student way of thinking um and at the same time it was um budget was limited so hence the the the, the, the neutral background but at the same time it worked for me in that i didn't want to put this character in a in a setting i didn't want to put her outside or yeah. indoors um i wanted to put her in a world where she has created herself so you, the viewer, you can make up or, um, or you can pick that up from, from what the government is doing. I'm saying that because a previous um, image, um, she's conducting a, a, um, a choir. So she's holding the, um, the baton, um, you know, she's you know, con conducting um, the music. So yeah, so that was kind of it. It's interesting to, to hear about your relationship and your love for plays and so pieces of theatres because your work does look extremely theatrical, mm -hmm. extremely operatic, mm -hmm. you know, and it's also taken many forms as well mm -hmm. from being the person, um, Sophie, that is, has taken many forms, yeah. um, from being the person she is molded and cast from to you personifying her through photography. Mm -hmm. And I think that like just tracing all of these forms, I'm just curious about what the move from donning the costume in front of the camera, in front of the lens, um, what did that afford you and what did it afford the work as well? Um, for the longest time until last week, because you were there um, at the How, um, at the Center of Less Good Idea, um, all these performances were always um, in a infinity, in a studio mm -hmm. where there'll be like six people at most. Um, and I think for me, it was the idea of control. Um, it was the idea of storytelling. I wanted to tell people like, oh, so here, this was what's happening. Um, so that also um, gave me the control of being um, being the cinematographer and also the director at the center. So I'm giving you a package. Because um, unlike if, if, if you come to the performance, then now I have to think of the theater of, or the um, the democracy of theater, mm -hmm. meaning that mm -hmm. while uh, we are all sitting here, if you are looking over there, you need to get an experience. If you are looking over there, mm -hmm. you have to get an experience. Mm -hmm. But this allows me to give you an, a perspective. So you don't choose, I choose. I give you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that was a great lecture. <laughs> <laughs> what are the books? Um, oh yeah, so for the first time I allowed people to be in the space and yeah, so that was um, kind of nerve-wracking at the same time <laughs> and it felt like I was breaking a spell for like since 2008 mm -hmm. and then now I'm letting people into <coughs> this world yeah. that I've always been creating and just telling people now, people are in there, like looking live. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, it was kind of, it, it took a lot. <laughs> it was yeah. also interesting to see that transformation on stage because um, I think when you were transforming into Sophie on that <coughs> stage I was consistently thinking about how they're Superman and then there's Clark you know but we never really get to see them in the same room mm -hmm. um, and that made me think of how the alter ego is not only an aspirational identity and a conduit to our other selves but also a, a self that cannot be in the same room as um, who we actually are, like mm -hmm. can't be in the same room in those <coughs> ways. So I'm wondering if there's ever been a conflict of identities between you and Sophie in those ways. Well, the thing is, Sophie is me. Like, um, she is that shadow that follows me. Um, as much as I can say I'm the first to, I'm the first to have a passport, I'm the first to travel. Um, these women that were not afforded all these um, necessities that I'm actually receiving now because I think about it, I didn't really fight for them. They were given to me uh, by all these women. So um, now I lost my train of thought. It happens a lot. And <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, me being so um, 
So, so for me, it it it, it works in 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 that way because I, I I can choose. I can choose to be Sophie. Mm -hmm. Now I'm dressing up and I'm doing these performances, but there's a time limit to it. Mm -hmm. Unlike my grandmother, she is who she is. Mm -hmm. um, there's no like, oh, just take it off now, done. Yeah. There's no cut. So that world of just um, 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 going into a real world and also in, in, in this fantastical world that I've created, um, it's, it's, it speaks of that, so there's a movie actually, Sophie's mm -hmm. Choice. It speaks of these choices that were afforded to me. I can choose, I can be, I can control, I can push back, I can pull. Um, so for me, it speaks of that freedom, actually. Okay. Um, it is interesting to hear that you do think of it as, like, as you, as the same person. So then that does lead me to the, um to ask you like when you saw Sophie on billboards in 2010 did that feel like seeing yourself on billboards mm, I always refuse to think about all the milestones that I've achieved in my <coughs> life because I feel like I don't want to have an ego mm. Ego is a killer ego mm. is a dangerous animal and once you embark on it or you become it you have to keep on feeding it and for me I, these, these are people's stories I have to respect um, um, wh what I have taken and also it's a burden because sometimes you get cousins calling you to ask for school fees money and you're like oh god I have to give because you know you you're in that um, center stage. But at the same time, I always tell them like, guys, if I if I did it and I'm doing it, it means it's in our DNA. It means like we can do it. Yeah. But uh, sometimes it's, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult mm -hmm. position to be in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Speaking of um, having this moment of we can do it, um, there's been a, a lot of cultural movements um, around um, black women and young black artists, young black visual artists who have been um, allowed to explode in the South African visual arts landscape in a way <laughs> uh, that, does, that hasn't really been done previously before. How do you feel? Um, do you feel any pressure from this? And how do you feel as a black visual artist um, witnessing this? It's great. It's amazing. I think the more the merrier. And I realize like actually I have influenced a lot of young artists. Mm -hmm. And I hardly ever say this. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's time that we that we talk about us. Mm -hmm. And um, it's time that we write books about us. It's time we make objects about us. Because mm -hmm. I think um, that it will make us understand us better. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm saying this because what I've also realized, I'm also in that bus, is um, a lot of South African um, artists that are actually um, talking or exploring um, ideas on identity. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, it's the idea of wanting to know who, what are we, who are we, mm -hmm. and where do we see ourselves. And um, yeah, so it's actually quite an exciting space. So the more the merrier. So, you know, because I feel like it, once you walk into that room, don't close the door, open it. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe, uh, you know, there's been there's been quite a dramatic shift. We, we associate you very closely with Sophie or you are associated with Sophie. But of course, Sophie was a start. And, um, you know, what's become clear even in an image like this, is that um, Sophie has always been more than what she's been boxed into, um, and that there's there's the desiring, there's a desiring, and there's an attention to imagination, and the possibilities of imagination, if not just to, if not to change the world out there, but starting with yourself and what you can give yourself the kinds of freedoms you can give yourself within the confines of your imagination even mm -hmm. or within the possibilities of your imagination but there's also been um in terms of 
in recent years, mm -hmm. there's been a shift uh, from Sophie to the purple yeah. mm -hmm. and now to the red. And it's been from this acknowledgement of um, a person that was constrained by history, mm -hmm. but given flight through imagination, mm -hmm. to this kind of tussle that happens between the purple and, the, and Sophie, to now this emergent red that's glorious <laughs> and resplendent yeah. in the red of anger. Do you want to talk us through the <coughs> journey that, that we've seen you come through? Mm. Um, so this work actually was, influ I was, so I was in Brazil. So what I always do when I go to any, any country in the world, I usually take the red bus. That's the quickest way, um, especially if you're not there for long, quickest way of mm -hmm. knowing mm -hmm. the history um, of the land. Mm -hmm. so, um, so now in Brazil, um, so we stopped at this cultural space and then I learned about the capoeira. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the capoeira, the martial arts, the slaves were uh, practicing it, but in a disguise of dance. Mm -hmm. Um, so the idea was later they will take over the master's house. Um, so this work was actually, um, so while I was listening to this man talking about this capoeira and the history and its origin, I was like, I can see it. It's just two, these two figures. Now in my work, I thought, well, two figures will be the old figure at that time. Uh, it would be um, Sophie and then meeting a new figure. Mm -hmm. Now, the blue and the purple are meeting. Mm -hmm. So the purple for me was, um, as I mentioned, like the, the, my work is very, is, is biographical. It's based on uh, women in my family who are all domestic workers. So this baton of, of servitude was passed on mm -hmm. from generation to generation up to me. So now the purple, I thought of, well, if I were to be in the same space um, as the blue figure, what kind of figure would, would, would I, the, the figure that would represent me, would look like? Mm. So um, I came across text by, um, actually my partner introduced me to text by um, Deleuze and Qatari on um, the rhizome. Mm -hmm. The roots, how how they how they grow from one place to the next, and how they sprout out, etc. So I was like, actually, this kind of speaks about me. Mm -hmm. Speaks also about uh, my lineage, and also it gave it gave a language on the fashion that um, that the purple figure is wearing. Mm -hmm. And also, when I was thinking of a color that speaks of me, or that color that should represent me, uh, I looked at different colors. Of course, you know, there's a spectrum in the world. Um, and I came across the color purple. So for me, the color purple is about resistance. It's about fighting. It's about um, fighting against injustice, colonialism, etc. Because in Cape Town in 1989, in September, people were marching against apartheid, as people did in, um, in those years. And um, the apartheid um, police laced their water cannons with purple dye. Mm -hmm. So everyone was covered in purple. And I was like, I love the story of this purple. It's a color of resistance. It's a color of, of it's a color of violence. Mm -hmm. And um, so that violence was met with greater violence. And that's how you can stop violence. But at the same time, violence doesn't stop, it yields. Mm -hmm. So it was just this predicament. So this purple for me speaks of where I was at that time. So now, the blue, which is my forebears, and the purple, which is me. Mm -hmm. Now these figures are looking at each other. They, they, they in, in a way, so who was um, saying farewell, because I, at some point I was like, I don't want to speak about these women in my family forever. Mm -hmm. They've been working for centuries and they worked for me. Mm -hmm. And at some point I need to put them away and just explore other means of making art or, other other ways or other other concepts mm -hmm. and then the purple um, figure emerged emerged so now these two figures are standing on um, a, um, a base circular so depending on where you are um, around the, the the two figures it looks like these figures are about to embrace then a few steps it looks like they're about to you know combat each other mm -hmm. so I thought of an artwork where usually you know when you go to a 
a gallery, you walk in, you take the blurb, you read, you look at the work, great. If it's a sculpture, you walk around it, great, you go home. I thought of a work where you, as a viewer, you have to animate it. You need to work for the work, not the work working for you. Um, so I was like, look, it would actually be amazing if just people, the viewer, um, wherever they are, they're getting this animation. And, and that was the idea that started in, in the studio, but it started all in Brazil. So, yeah. And I want to mention the red, because yes. you, you also speak quite specifically. Um, I, I, think, I think people are going to want to hear about these sort of tentacular oh, yes. amoeba-like forms. So maybe you want to speak to that before we go move to the red. To the red, yeah. So this is 2013. Um, and so now this is the death of Sophie. The apron is falling. The, the headscarf is being pulled away by these um, creatures. And I wanted to make, so at some point, people were telling me, I used to get a lot of the, at this Facebook time, get a lot of DMs coming like, I think you should do this with Sophie. You should, you know, like, hey, when I meet people, I think you should do that. I, I, funny enough, I always listen. I always, I always enjoy those kind of stories when people are telling me, like, you should do this. And I was like, actually, why are people telling me what to make about this character? There must be something. And I realized Sophie is every woman. She's your aunt. She's that lady that looks after your kids. She's the neighbor. So everyone feels that they actually own Sophie. And I was like, you know what? Maybe this is the end. So pack away, Sophie. Now, um, um, I was like, okay, now that I'm in the studio, I just received um, the Standard Bank Young Artist Award. I was actually coming here. So I'm preparing to come to Makanda. Um, I was like, I don't want to make figures anymore. I'm done. Now what, I want to make something that I've never seen before. Of course, this is a dream. You can't make something that you've never seen before. <laughs> um, whatever you make, it will always represent something. It will always look like something. And of course, this is the 21st century. We're not inventing, we're just you know, remixing. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually a documentary called Everything's Remix. You should check it out. Um, so now this was actually deconstructing the body, just taking it and taking it apart. And what does it mean? If I were to smash this figure with a hammer and take a, just a tiny piece of, well, um, of debris, let's just call it that, um, what if I were, and then put it um, under a microscope, how would it look like? It would look like these things. And um, my seamstress and I started making them. So I had to draw them because I was like, I need to make this. And I was talking to her, she's like, I, I can't see it, I can't see it. I was like, and I started drawing it. And then, um, so at some point, her and I, we, we spoke, a, we, we had this symbiotic relationship that is it, as if she saw my, my head or what was in my head. Um, so made these, um, I call them non-winged ceiling beings. Um, so these things, like they look, they have, they take on a, an organic form. Yeah. Um, and now I was like, and then I had them in the studio and then at some point I started hanging them. I was like, actually it makes sense that I hang them. And then the viewer just mazes around this, this purple forest. But I felt like there was just something missing and brought back the figure again. I was like, this, these creatures, they need the mother. So think about this. If this was a moving picture, um, the figure will actually push out each um, creature and hang it, push out, hang, push out and hang to a point where now this figure is actually engulfed by these um, organic um, forms. So she's actually literally giving birth on stage. So this was actually also a performance. So um, what I did was um, I, uh, so all, all, with all the performances that I do, I usually have a brief with the photographer. Um, I don't call myself a photographer because I don't follow the principles of photography. Um, so it's always like a collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, I go, look at um, a Kanye West, I know a controversial figure. Kanye West power um, video. Yes. Um, <laughs> and then combine it with, um, ooh, what's his name? Uh, damn. 
got his name. Also, do you know? Oh, sorry. Maybe we'll come back. That guy. <laughs> um, he did like all these abstract um, um, uh, uh, organic forms that were just floating in. They looked like they were floating in water, but actually not. Oh, it was coming, it was coming. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so that um, and and so that had to lay in a, a display um, all that hang hang the creatures and I stood in the center. But then at some point the photographer said, "You know what? Because you are into details. So the idea is if there's a if there's a thread somewhere, you need to see it." So um, it's like, no, let's actually divide this image into three parts. So it was the figure in the center the left forest and the right forest and the back forest. And these were stitched on, um, um, on um, Photoshop. So if it was actually a, 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 a video, you as a viewer, you will see um, this figure giving birth on, on stage. So that was the purple figure. Because we see in the next, uh, in the next slide, yeah. and seeing here, quite, you're showing us this move from the blue to the purple mm. into now what is the, what the, a major character now for you, the red. Mm -hmm. um, and the red was conceived while you were pregnant. Uh, so do you want to tell us a little bit about this and about the Domba dance? Yeah. So, um, so this is 2015. I'm pregnant. <laughs> um, lying in bed, I didn't do anything. I think um, it's true that there's actually a thing called the pregnant pregnant mind. Um, I was just sitting at home, didn't go to the studio. And um, what I've also realized that when one is pregnant, you're highly emotional. You laugh when it's funny. You cry when it's actually sometimes you don't need to cry. So I was like, um, uh, it, was just a, it was just a different a different phase in my life. And I just couldn't, couldn't recognize myself at some point. And um, and I was addicted to watching the news. Um, and I also listened to 702, which I, at some point I stopped. Um, and um, there was just this darkness that was spread on the radio where, you know, we're going down as South Africans. We, it's just, there's, there was just no hope. And I'm, now I'm pregnant, lying down in bed. And I'm like, oh God. So now imagine if the, a world where I can actually fix the world. Mm -hmm. So there's an image, I don't know if you have it, where um, I did a shoot where I was pregnant and then have the, and I had these dogs being sent out. So that was the, actually the beginning of, so this is a sculpture, but yeah, it's close to it. This one. So wow. yeah, I was seven months pregnant, and then um, so I, I I work with the foundry. They're actually in White River. So I call Michael up, like Michael, I have this idea. I'll send you images. Can you make me dogs, angry dogs? And Michael was like, How do we? How do we make angry dogs? I was like, Just make hellhounds. Combine that with wolves, but at the same time, it's. Uh, Bay, everything must be exaggerated. The teeth are actually um, not your normal Staphylococcus terrier teeth. Um, they are hyena teeth. So, um, and you can see that the body is tense. You can actually hear the snarling of this. Um, you can hear the sound. And, 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 and this actually image is breaking the fourth wall because it's pouring into you. So this is actually life-size because we, um, printed um, and they actually these dogs are coming into your space and that's the idea that I wanted like you know to have that feeling as as, as, as you standing in front of it and you know have that experience as, as, as a viewer as if these things are just about to jump on your on your on your face and um, so so that these angry dogs um, are actually jumping into our space. And this work speaks of emotion. So going back to me being pregnant, being highly emotional. And I was like, if as a visual artist, if I were to speak of emotions, what kind of visual icons would I use? So in Isuzulu, or in the Nguni languages, because I speak Swat, in the, in the Nguni languages, when someone is angry, they're angry, they become a red dog. So these are the red dogs. 
And when I was thinking of um, the breed, because so many breeds in the world, um, in Barton, where I grew up, um, outside the city hall, there's, um, there's a statue of um, Jock of the Bushveld. <laughs> Jock of the Bushveld, you guys know the story, there's, there's literature, there's movies, and even animation and video games about this dog, how loyal and obedient this dog was. So I, I like those characters when they were describing this dog. So I took that dog because that's the dog that I used to see every day. And of course, as South Africans, we, we, we have a different relationship with dogs. Mm -hmm. Whether you're thinking of the, the, the shepherd, mm -hmm. um, the German shepherd. Mm -hmm. The German shepherd is always, there's a, always the, there's a white man always holding it back, a policeman. So you've seen that images mm -hmm. everywhere. So I didn't want the German shepherd because it, um, it wasn't close to me. Um, and and also, it was just one of those dogs where, you know, like they repeated everywhere, and I, just, um, and I didn't want to associate myself with that, with that, um, with that breed. Um, so for me, it made sense to take this dog that I used to see as a child going to town every day, and then just turn it into a hellhound going to fix the world against injustice, against colonialism, against slavery. But this is all a dream. It's, 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 it's a studio. With the red. So um so now the, the work started um expanding. So the, the dogs were the first introduction in me speaking of emotions. So they were the first introduction that if I were to speak of emotions of course, there's so many emotions. Like in in English, the um the the the, 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 the usually um um the locus, which is the container, is associated with a few um, emotions, whether it's love, joy, um, and uh, joy, anger. But in in the Nguni, it's much more broader. Um, it's tolerance, intolerance, impatient, patient and impatient. So it goes on and on and on. So these dogs for me were the starting point, and now I introduce the red figure, which she embodies um, um, the, 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 this anger emotion. And um, I feel like this is where we are as South Africans. It's just a lot of anger. Mm -hmm. And this is what I picked up while I was lying in bed listening to the radio. Mm -hmm. There was just protests everywhere. People were burning down schools, which to me, to, that's still to this day, doesn't make sense. People were burning down stuff that will actually help us in the future. Mm -hmm. So I picked up a lot of... Um, a, 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 a lot of anger that is actually going around um, in, in our communities. And I was like, is this the legacy of apartheid? And while I was questioning myself um, and the, these, these, these um, titles came into mind, um, the rise, the fall, the legacy. So for me, the rise would be the purple border work because it speaks of um, these um, black women who were limited that it was actually double discrimination. Double discrimination in that they were firstly they were black and mm -hmm. secondly they were women, mm -hmm. and then um, the um, and then the purple border work um, speaks of um, the fall. Mm -hmm. So the nineteen eighty six, which was like a few years before um, um, what do you call it, the first um, what do you call it democratic um, what do you call it. Um, Elections, yeah, and then now I'm um, speaking of the legacy. So this, you know, like uh, uh, gathering all these stuff that makes us us, and um, making work out of that. Um, this leads me to just looking at all at this work, and also um, a terrible beauty. A terrible beauty is born. Mm. The purple ones before. Um, the ways in which you work with mythology, fantasy, world building, symbolism um, <coughs> makes me wonder if you consider yourself a surrealist artist. Can you talk us through, well, you have talked us through this work, um, but yeah, do you, mm -hmm. would you think of yourself as such? I usually don't box myself as this type of artist because as soon as you are in that box, you can't jump out and go to another box. Mm -hmm. So just about where I am at that time, what I'm thinking. Um, and this work actually, um, 
so clothed in the skin of righteousness. So I learned that there are two types of um, anger. Um, so there's righteous anger and unrighteous anger. Righteous anger um, seeks um, restoration and unrighteous seeks destruction. So this work speaks of that way. These hellhounds are now clothed in this um, in, in sheep's skin. But then when I was thinking of the sheep's skin, I was like, I wanted to bring back the work that I've done before. So hence the green, which um, um, speaks of the toy soldiers that I, that, I, that, I, that I make in my work. And that's the book, um, that's the body of work where I'm looking at my father as a man, as an absent man. Um, and the blue body of work, um, looking at um, the domestic workers in my family, the purple, um, that was me, how, where, I, where I see myself and how I see myself. And then the red is the emotion, like the anger, exploring that. And then these, these, these hellhounds are actually hiding um, under these um, sheep heads. And um, this red figure is placing or about to place the, sheep, the sheep's head on the, on the dog at the same time patting it. If we go back to the to the to, to the Domba dance, um we'll come back to here. Yeah, this this work right here. So imagine if it was um a moving picture. So um the work where the title right now where um the figure, the purple figure sending these dogs out. So think about it, if it was a, a film now these dogs, um, they've all gone out to actually fix the world. And then now they're coming back. So you can see that dog is actually tired. Mm -hmm. And also what I've learned, anger is tiring. Mm -hmm. There's just no freedom in anger. So these dogs have gone to fix what, but what are they fixing? Because <coughs> we are deeper than that. Like the fix will just take centuries. Um, now these dogs are back and then they're coming back to the motherboard. The, 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 the red figure is feeding um, these dogs, these tired dogs, a piece of her heart. Um, I don't know if you have a zoom in, but it's fine. So the, 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 right, um, the right hand is holding um, a, a, a larger than life heart, which is the locus, the container. That's where all these emotions are sitting. And the figure, it has beaten it and she's feeding the tired dog. Um, so each dog, when, when it gets the piece of the heart, it, it, you know, it, it, each dog grows um, four heads. Um, so it speaks of cerebrals. And then, um, and, and I thought, well, that I wanted the red figure to re-anger these um, dogs. Um, go back again. So it's this loop that we actually catch mm -hmm. ourselves in, like just same thing over and over again. To a point where you know time is the concept, which I think I want to explore. Time. It's funny. Imagine if you we were we we had the ability to control time. The other day, um, on um Instagram, um, I saw this guy who wants to be he's four, I think he's fifty something. He wants to be as young as his sixteen year old son. So he's taking these pills. Like it's just so amazing, like reversing time. So imagine if people had the ability of manipulating time. <laughs> <laughs> so earlier you spoke uh, a bit more about the red dogs. But, yeah, sorry, sorry. Earlier you spoke a bit more about the red dogs and how they came specifically from saying in Swati. Yeah. Um, and you just um, spoke about the four-headed dog, which is like Cerberus. Mm. I wanted to ask you if in your works are there any other mythologies that you are um, grappling with, particularly from Kunguni side or in just general culture? Um, I, so this, the, it started like a few years ago where I was looking at my language as, as a concept or, or as an idea. Um, and right now I'm still developing that language, which is actually exciting. 
because I feel like with the other works, it's just, you know, when you feel like something is done yeah. and then with the red border work, there's still, it feels like there's still just more I can learn, more I can learn about language. And the more I feel like I'm learning about my own language, it feels like there's a closer understanding of who I am or who my family is. I can I don't know, I cannot speak of um, South Africa, but I can speak of what I see in my family. So there's also that understanding. So it's kind of getting closer to to understanding of what I am, who I am. So using my home language. You know, when, when, when you dream, I don't know, I dream in sweat. So when I get nervous, all languages go away. My swatik just, you know, comes through. Um, so for me, it's, it's that, just bringing that language and just, you know, making work out of my home language. It's really beautiful. I think that there are a lot of, um, very interesting symbolism, very interesting mm -hmm. imagery, mm -hmm. especially across the Nguni languages. Um, but going back to, you spoke about um, design and imagination, and I wanted, I wanted to ask, I'm very curious about, um, if you could tell us a bit about, um, in your practice, how you frame desire and, imagine, and imagination as a tool to recuperate um, Black women in post colonial South Africa, in apartheid and in democratic South Africa. But there's a danger in um, um, being a, a savior. But I, what I always do is I speak of my position. The thing is, I know my position is not unique. Mm -hmm. There's a, a lot of people who can relate to it. Um, so I always just avoid going like, that community is doing this. I always, I always go, I am doing this. We are doing this as my family. Um, yeah. That's really beautiful. Um, actually, this work right here was actually influenced by, um, uh, what's, what's his name? Oh, Asuka. <laughs> Yasuke, yes. We spoke about it a few years ago. So, um, also speaking of um, history, I always question history because history is that one um, story mm -hmm. that we are given. So this, um, just by chance, I stumbled upon this, um, this character, Yasuke. So Yasuke um, was a samurai, and he ascended um, to the highest rank of being a samurai, and, and he was African. So now this is like 400 years ago, where we are told that black bodies did not move freely. And then here is Yasuke in Japan being on the highest rank. I was like, so now it made me think like, what, what is, is, is this, sounds like history is actually a story, not actually mm -hmm. an actual documentation of what happened. Mm -hmm. So this work for me, I was like, when I came across the story, I was like, I need to make work out of this character. So important in my life right now. And it resonates with what, what, I, what, what I'm thinking and what I, how I see the world and how I relate to the world. And of course, this figure is holding um, the locus, the container yeah. of those emotions, mm -hmm. which is holding that stuff. So you can also imagine with the stuff, the golden stuff, you can imagine the, the dogs, they're somewhere, they're lurking. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's not just dogs, right? Because there's also, you, you know, you're working with horses, yes. you work with doves, uh, you work with vultures. So there's a lot of animal symbolism in your work. Yeah. So, um, can, can you speak us to speak to us about uh, how the why these this animal symbolism is so important mm -hmm. to the kinds of ways in which you're speaking about society uh, both in terms of, of from the personal but where that personal meets mm -hmm. public um, so the vultures for me they work as sweepers um, they are the cleaners so after the the hellhounds have destroyed and um, ripped apart all that is not good in our land. The vultures will come and clean up. And um, so how I thought of these vultures was one time I was reading about the Tibetan um, funeral, the sky um, funerals, where they just chop up the body and then just feed it to the to the to the vultures. So it's that idea of um, the circle of life, just mm -hmm. beginning is the end, the end is the beginning. Such a, it's, I know it's so 
violent, but it's so beautiful and just giving back mm -hmm. to earth. So I was like, I, I like this this idea of having vouchers that will come and clean up. And then from the cleaning up, something beautiful will come up again. So, um, yeah, so that for me, it's... Is, this, so is this how you want your funeral? <laughs> <laughs> like a whole bunch of vouchers out yeah, there? Yeah, just okay. devouring me. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if... Um, uh, Sashlarana, can you move to sort of image 20 and 21? Um, so this is the... <coughs> Yeah, we're seeing some yep. of the vultures there. Yep. Um, and then also in, in 21 as well, um, this use of of uh, toy soldiers, right? And, and you've yep. already spoken to that in terms of of your father mm -hmm. and, and being called up into the army and then sort of disappearing. And, and that actually just speaks to some very complicated personal history, mm -hmm. but it's a history that's familiar with so <coughs> many people uh, True. True. in this country. I mean, when you speak to Lebo Khanye, when you speak to Lebo Mogul, uh, I'm sorry, Mabusela. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she calls herself Mogul. Yeah. Um, but the, it's, it's, it's an incredibly sad story of, of uh, fathers who have either chosen to or because of circumstances could not be in mm -hmm. the lives of their children. Mm -hmm. But also, that's not a past situation. That's still a very much a present situation totally. with a continuous single mothers that we still have bearing the burden. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe you want to want to speak to us because I mean this this work also was at the Venice Biennale, right? Yeah, in twenty eleven. Yeah, and I think continuously. Can I just add to that? Um, I think I'm also curious about the extent that this anger that you're working with goes to like is. Is it also Mary's anger? <laughs> Sorry. So, um. It is. It is in a way. I think we should be angry. Mm. Anger gets shit done. No, anger gets <laughs> things done. Um, um. <laughs> you can't. You part Africans and Babatan, eh? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the story of the toy soldier. It is a story because um, it became a story. Um, but the absent fathers, it's it's not, it's so South African, mm. it's so around the world mm. when it comes to black communities. Um, but of course, it's, it, coming back home to me, um, my father was recruited. They were looking for young men, young, mm. enabled young men, black men. And he was at the right, he was there, he was the right age. And um, so he was taken. And also, um, um, also, it was also another form of a job. He needed to yeah. buy bread. He needed to take care of his family. Yeah. Um, so a lot of young black men were taken away um, because of that. Um, so um, so this, this, the story of, um, or the, 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 the concept of um, toy soldiers in my work um, came about when I was looking at the family album. So my mother had about three, four, four photographs of my dad and two of them, he was wearing an army uniform. Um, and the other one is um, carrying an AK-47. I don't know, well, a big gun, big machine gun. <laughs> um, and um, so when I was thinking of like, how do I actually make work around my father? Because at some point I was making work about women in my family, but there was just this other, other side of my life that I was actually wanting to dive into and explore and and just study, um, and the toy soldier came about. It, so as a child, um, I used to look at the family album. My my my, my, my father was wearing a army uniform. So in my childlike um, mind, I always envisioned him as a this to giant giant toy soldier. So he's a little bit taller than me, so you can imagine how big he is. <laughs> um, so, and, 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 and also how I knew of him was not from first person what he was telling me who he was. I knew him through what my mom was telling me. I knew him what, from what my grandmother was telling me. So hence he takes on a female um, form. Um, and because I, I, I couldn't place him. So whatever ideas I had of him, I think sometimes they were misregistered 
misrepresented. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to take that and put that in this in 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 in, in my work because this is actually a true South African story mm -hmm. that we all have um, ideas of. Who, of who other people are, especially when it comes to um, black men, like a lot of households, um, you know, like there's, there's absent fathers, but this goes down from from centuries up to up to um, right now. Mm. Yeah. Lot, yeah, not last question, but um, yeah. We must, you must, do we now, much later, we're running out of time, you can't keep going back to the first page. <laughs> 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 yes, and I know because she, she must have a personal interview with you because she wants to ask this question on monumentality. Oh, yeah, okay. monuments. Next, yeah. Next, next time. Um, maybe. So we're going to skip because we do want to also give the audience an opportunity to speak to you. Um, so maybe you run, you run your, you run a studio, right? Can you give us some insight into what the sort of the, your, your daily work, working practice is like in Ameri Sabande studio? Um, my studio is at Atom Main right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm, I am uh, William Kentridge's neighbor. So <laughs> once in a while he'll come and see what I'm doing and I'll go also see what he's up to. Um, um, the studio feels like a nine to five now. Now that I have a child, unlike before, I'll just wake up whenever, make work, whether it's three o'clock in the morning or whatever time, I'll make work. But now I have to be home because I don't want to be an absent mom in the name of art. So I, I, drop him, I drop off my son at school, go to the studio, pick him up at three. So between um, eight o'clock and three, that's where I make work. And um, so this, this, this discipline has been working for me for the last three years. And I've been, you know, just making sure that I, when I'm in the studio, I don't play. Just work, yeah. work, 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 work. When I, get, when, I, when I get home, that's when I can think of ideas. So when I'm in the studio, I work. When I'm home, I think of what, what other ideas can I explore, do research after hours at home. Yeah. So in terms of, sort of look, of, of making these sculptures, uh, we, when we look at these price tags, it seems nice, like hefty price tags, but we don't actually think about what it costs to make. for black women to make monumental works on these scales, because a lot of them are also larger than life, and, they, mm -hmm. and they're installative, because as you said, you're creating scenes, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, tell us, so, so give us some very frank insight into what does it, make, what does it actually cost to make one of these? Um, I. Someone said, um, "I'll never be rich." Because every time <laughs> when I get money, I make more, the more, more. Let's make. I, I I enjoy, I guess, making stuff. Um, I I always think the money will come later, and also it's not about that, but it is about that. The school fees has to be paid. Um. Well, I've been fortunate that I've been working with galleries that are supportive in my in my colossal works. Um, sometimes they go, no, no, that's too much. Calm down. Um, but um, yeah, so just uh, usually present the idea and then we'll research how much it will cost. We we'll get quotes. And then, um, so most of these works are actually traveling right now. Some of them are just in the, in the, in the um, what do you call it, storeroom. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for the day where they will all sell. Mm -hmm. so, so for instance, no, give a, don't get ideological. So, I mean, <laughs> so say Sophie, so the rain, Sophie yeah. no horse. Yeah. How much does it make for you to produce something like that? Jeez, a horse at that time was around just just the horse was a hundred and twenty. So that's a real figure. And then um, I haven't calculated the figure that's on top, which is life size, as big as I am. And the vultures, because you know, like vultures sometimes when you, when you, when you, when, um, with the wings stretched out, it can actually be, the length could be about three meters. Um, so it's, yeah, it's quite a heavy invoice <laughs> at the end of the day. Yeah, and I'm asking that because I think you know, people just take it for granted. Mm -hmm. And and mm -hmm. what you're doing is so amazing and unbelievable. Mm -hmm. 
but in terms of also just you know for yeah. years sculpture has been prohibitive <laughs> printmaking has been prohibitive but we actually have now finally have a generation that's able to sort of make and speak back to that mm. so Lonnie's going to ask a final question no one's going to ask a final question and i'm going to ask a final question okay yes um, <laughs> it's the last page. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, could you please tell us about um, the artists that you that you were influenced by? I mean, earlier you spoke a bit about Kanye West and the artist we didn't really get the name of, but mm -hmm. you spoke about Marco Brambilla. Okay. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> you guys should check out his videos. Um, amazing, Marco Brambilla. Yeah. So, um, could you also take us through artists that influence you, um, mm -hmm. that help you shape your career, and even artists that influence you now? Um, so, right when I was doing my fourth year, I looked at Tracy Rose, mm -hmm. uh, how she does her performances, mm -hmm. whether it's in public or in a in a in a shower, because I wrote a, um, um, a, a a page or a text on on her detailed one and two where she's in the shower and then um, also you, the viewer, you're actually looking looking at her from bird's eye view or CCTV um, mm -hmm. view. I um, also looked at um, Kara Walker, <coughs> who's played an important role in my in my in my in my art practice. And of course Yinka Shonibari. Mm -hmm. um, you can see like a lot of Yinka here. And then um, also South American artist Make the conversation piece. He's gone, but yeah, mm -hmm. actually, he is actually the one who I was like, actually, I want to make life-size figures, mm -hmm. and also look at um, a lot of fashion designers, um, like the Queen, um, um, yeah. So just the and um, who else do I look at? Noria Mabas. I think for me, I'll tell you why she actually played a very important role in while I was shaping this myth, that this mythological figure mm -hmm. that is Sophie. Um, one time, um, so I, so as a student, um, we discovered that she doesn't make work if she hasn't dreamt of it. Mm -hmm. She would just go and just not make it all. I was like, wow, I like that. Mm -hmm. So if she dreams of something, she will make. So the, for me, the idea of dreaming, mm. that's where I took that idea. I was like, I love this, but but what if I don't dream like her? Because we all have different gifts. <laughs> so I took that, um, and hence this, this, the, 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 the figure's eyes are always closed, going to a dreamland. Mm. So she played a pivotal role in actually furnishing this figure that is Sophie, and also creating mm. myths, because myths tell us who we are. Mm. Um, we use myths to talk about our culture, about our our being. Mm -hmm. So this mythological figure that is Sophie actually comes from that because when you dream of something, immediately it goes to the mytho mythological world because it's not real, it's mm -hmm. not historical, it's not a, an actual event that happened. So yeah. May I sneak in one last half question, please? Hmm? May I sneak in one last half, it's a half question. Half yes, half I'm question. curious, yeah. what music do you listen to? I listen to right now. I'm listening to Odetta. Okay. Um, Sakura. You guys should um, check out that song. So Odetta was um she was she was she recorded um songs in Japan in 1956. Mm -hmm. She's um Black American. Mm -hmm. Um. So for me, like this woman going to Japan and just singing this foreign language. And so at some point, even though I don't understand, I, I don't know, um, I can't, well, I can't speak Japanese, but you can hear that actually it's at some point she kind of speaking, um, the accent is not really Japanese, it's just off, but I love that. <laughs> Similar to Lauren Hill when, when she's singing, no me quita pa. When she goes, pa! I don't know, in French, I don't think they go, Mikita Pa, you know. Um, and also Nina Simone, she influenced a lot of my um, my titles, uh, my work. I uh, listen to Shade. I listen to Tupac. Um, I listen to, 
Ooh, 90s R&B. That's my jam. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> there is the saying that we get stuck in the music that we first got laid to. That's true. It's just the saying. That's true. Uh, with my last question, um, you touched on it a little bit. I wanted to ask about, it's not really about how motherhood has affected your work, but it's just that I want to prompt that, which you said um, when you're talking about work that you're currently busy with and you're talking to Kentridge about how about the hands. The hands, yeah. Yeah, so I just want to prompt that question. So to just get to the question, I'm just going to ask... Um, how motherhood has affected your work and also like where your work is currently? Um, it influenced me a lot because when my partner and I were thinking of making a baby, the purple bottle work emerged that the with the giving with the giving birth and the creatures. So in my head I was like, now there's this gonna be this creature that's growing in my <laughs> in my belly and then I have to take care of it. So that was yeah, so hence the the, the, the creatures being you know being pushed out um on stage. Um it has influenced me in 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 the in, in that um it actually pushed me in in thinking and um, investigating and making work about emotions. Mm -hmm. And um, and of course, when we speak of emotions, it brought up a um, range of emotions, but I chose one and that was anger. So I don't think if I was, if I wasn't pregnant, <coughs> I don't think I would have thought of emotions. I don't know, maybe. Um, what else? Um, the hands, the hands. Um, so right now I'm making small works, I know, like I make like monumental works where it's like larger than life. Um, and then now I've actually made things small. I've shrunk everything. So now it's like this size. Um, I've been meaning to make small works, but what I've realized is that small works, you need to be patient. You need to have the heart. You need to sit down and sculpt this thing in clay. Um, and um, at some point I was like, I really have to do it. And then I stopped because I, I don't have the patience to make hands. Mm -hmm. um, hands, just the, those are the most difficult things that you can sculpt because mm -hmm. they might just end up looking like sausages, like five sausages <laughs> stuck on a ball. <laughs> so one time my son, so he's into Harry Potter. So he was playing with Harry Potter. There's this figure, um, Voldemort, which is like 30 centimeters high. And then Harry Potter, so he's like, Shh, play, you know, play. Um, so they both have magic wands. And I looked at the 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 the, the, the Voldemort um, hands. It's so perfect. Because mm -hmm. usually with toys, it's always simplified. Mm -hmm. But these hands, I was like, I want to take his hands. So I took the hands and, I, and now his daughter doesn't have hands. <laughs> <laughs> So I took the I, I, I took the hands now. I started making um. So now I'm on uh, edition two. So I made two. Then I'm doing a jump into the, the third one because it just made life easier. I didn't have to think about making hands. So now I actually my son and I enjoy going to toy um toy shops because that's where I'm always looking for. Um, hands, I'm also, I'm always looking for how you know the, the body proportions. But sometimes, most of the time, we don't buy anything, which is also funny with him. Like we all actually go and look. He also likes looking. Like usually, kids were like, "I want this, I want that." Uh, once in a while, you go, "Okay, can I have this?" But we enjoy going to toy shops and just looking at toys <laughs> for different reasons, of course. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so final question, Mary. Yeah. Um, so, can you tell us, uh, are you in fact a manifestation of God? Um, <laughs> and if so, what kind of offerings would you prefer? <laughs> God complex. I always stay away. Um, you might want to look at the image behind you. <laughs> 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 the idea of manifesting and making things come to life, the idea of being um, a priestess, the idea of having a certain presence, which I'm always aware of, that I have, 
I don't know, it could be my height. People oh, are maybe. always intimidated. It used to feel, it used to make me feel some kind of way when I was younger, but now I own it. Mm. It's like, I love it. It's better you be intimidated than me. Mm. But at the same time, shit scared. <laughs> <laughs> so this work, um, so for the first time, um, we went, uh, we shot in action, in actual location, not in, in a studio on an infinity wall. So there's a decommissioned um, church in Cape Town and um, decided to make these stained glass windows. Mm. And this, this, I call the figure, the purple figure, the, the, pe the purple and red, the high priestess, just mm. manifesting, calling out, whatever you want, just call it, we will come to you. Mm. Just gathering all these dark clouds. And then the, 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 the heart there um, at the top is lit. Mm. It's, it's lighting everything. And the reflection of, of the stained glass window is on the, is, is you can see on the floor. And then um, this white figure is praying into this, um, the stuff that is about to call the red dogs of anger. And she's, looked, and she's all pure white, which for me is the start or the beginning. Um, I always, when I'm in between works, when I don't know what to make, mm -hmm. I always call the high priestess mm -hmm. and then I dress up and I go to the studio and shoot. And then it feels like the next body of work will come. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds some kind of magic car or some kind of other world, but I think um, I've decided to just own that energy, mm -hmm. just be in that energy. But of course, most of it is created. It's not real. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's only not real until it becomes so. Yeah. Yeah. So, Mary, this is a very, very quick segment here. We call this uh, the Marcel Proust, uh, Bernard Pivot, James Lipton, Art on Our Mind Questionnaire. It's a quick fire. One word, like we're going to go like that. Yeah. Are you ready, Mary? You. Okay. <laughs> What delights you instantaneously? Sausages. <laughs> what's, what's your pet peeve, your pet irritation? Pet irritation? Uh, I don't like cats. I don't know. <laughs> no, like what irritates you? Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> I'll explain. Okay. No, no explanation. What's your least favorite color? Gold. Uh, do you have a favorite book or writer? Or if you were a literary character, who would you be? Uh, I'll be Nina Simone. Who is your favorite artist? Favorite artist, visual or music? If you're answering these questions however you want, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would love to be a combination of Shade. Lauren Hill and Nina Simone. <laughs> uh, do I need to ask you who your favorite heroine is? Uh, I know it might sound corny, but my grandmother. Yes. <laughs> if you could wish any one artwork into your life, which one would it be? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Quick yeah. I don't I don't know. I don't know. I just I think. Quick, Mary. Next one. Anything. 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 I always I've, I've, I've always wanted to um own a, a Tracy Rose Excellent. to a point where I've spoken to her and we yeah. <laughs> Is there any artwork or art movement that you dislike? You, you. <laughs> abstract, abstract, because I always don't, I don't get it. <laughs> uh, what kind of song gets you going? Uh, right now, I'm listening to, to Sakura, or Odetta singing Sakura in okay. opera kind of style, but Japanese. What is your favorite word? Actually. <laughs> What is your least favorite word? F-U-C-K. Yeah. What turns you on? 
Um, <laughs> new ideas. New ideas. <laughs> what turns you off? Uh, <laughs> not making stuff. I don't know. <laughs> what makes you laugh? Uh, what makes me laugh? Uh, <laughs> happiness makes me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> What's your best virtue? Uh, I, I know, I know. Best virtue, Mary. Actually, what's the meaning of that? Your, one of your best qualities. What's your best quality? Um, I can see things when someone is talking. I, can, I, see, I see images. I get you on that one. What is your idea of misery? Uh, not being able to think. What sound or noise do you love? Uh, my kid laughing. <laughs> what sound or noise do you hate? Uh, dogs barking, I know. <laughs> I hate dogs. <laughs> what is your favorite swear word? Swear words. Yeah. Your favorite one? Mother, father. <laughs> <laughs> What profession other than your own would you have liked to have attempted? Uh, being a manager at Woolworths. <laughs> <laughs> what, what profession would you not like to have done? Not like to... Uh, you know, teaching takes a lot to teach. Um, right now, we have a few students in the studio, and it takes a lot because I just get myself like being in their world and get so frustrated because sometimes they're not seeing it, and I want them to see it. So, one word, Mary. <laughs> I don't know. Yes. Sorry. How would you? Uh, how would you like to die? Oh, I want to disappear. Oh. But my son has to know that I'm dead. Sounds a little bit like Moses, okay? <laughs> All right. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at those pearly gates? You, you, you could. You did amazing. Yeah. Mary? You did amazing. <laughs> the audience for a few questions for Mary before we end the session. Yes, Piliswa. Um, I want to ask, because uh, I think a lot of the images that you saw, it's artworks in the gallery, like in the white space. Um, I just want you to share maybe one experience where you created the work outside, uh, yeah. whether it was a Sophie or a purple one. Yeah, there's been um, a couple of works that were, that, that are actually exhibited outside. I made a a life size, actually larger than life, um, sewing machine foot um, was exhibited outside. Um, there's a sewer in the field where Sophie, um, so the action is she has seeds um, in, on, on her blouse and the idea she's throwing them out. So it's made out of bronze. Um, it's standing outside a museum somewhere in the US, I forgot. Um, there's, yeah, there's a couple of works that are actually out outdoors out there yeah hi Mary. hey um i just want to ask what is your relationship with your with curators with art historians writers with um, the foundry i mean what is that relationship like yeah it was also something of like the progress of your work you know Beyond the gallery, that way, um, what happens if you die? Who owns this work? Um, if I die, my son will own everything. So I made a will. There's a will. You have to be responsible yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and his name is Mafa. It means inheritance. Aww. But it's a, but it's a family name, so it wasn't planned. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't planned. Um, relationship with curators. Um. 
open studio. If curators and idea are always, I love new ideas. I love being invited to stuff. I love being challenged. I love being told that, like, you know what, how about if you try something new? Um, I, I, I love working with um, historians. Hence, I can't say no to Shalin Khan every time when she calls. And I was like, Shalin, you know I can't talk in front of people, but you can't say no to Shalin. So yeah, those kind of relationships. Like I uh, always nurture those because that's where ideas come from. And that's where ideas start, I think. And relationship with families. Um, they're actually my third hand. Wow. Family. It's like, can you make me a voucher? Because seriously, time doesn't allow me to make all these things that I have in my head. So I always have someone else has to help out. Mm -hmm. Shall we? Uh, I can make it. Yes. Yeah. And then there's another hand at the back as well. Hi, Mary. Um, Hi. Quick question. Uh, who and who or what is God to you? Sometimes I feel like there's just not a single person that is a God, but even though um, text and people are telling us, telling that to us, uh, it's a, um, it's God is a, a mythological figure that we have created as people. I think that I know there's, there, there is a higher being in my language. We call, we call him Vilimadi. Um, so there is a creator, but I don't know if, if, if they are called God. Thank you. It's not a question. Oh, okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's not a question for me. Uh, I think it's a comment or something that you may look into. I don't know how to phrase it. Yeah. But I I think of something in me from how you you speak of your son. I think he might be your next <laughs> you or Mary or yeah. whatever. But in a in, in a male version yeah. or from your father or I don't know. I just thought I should share that. You could be right. <coughs> um, he has a different way of thinking. <laughs> um I say this because um he's on the spectrum. Um so the way he sees things mm -hmm. and how he actually is looking at life. Mm -hmm. I love how he's thinking. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and what we always try and do, his father and I, is just saturate his world with the things that he wants to see. Mm -hmm. um, and we we're fortunate that he actually um, he goes to a school where just there are a lot of boys like him. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see like he thinks visually. Mm -hmm. So in a few years, I don't know. Back. And then. Oh. Yes, I noticed that there's something that's distinctive about each, like all of your art um, pieces. And I guess what I wanted to know is, um, is that is that consistency a deliberate choice? And how important do you think it is for an artist to maintain that consistency? Well, it's important that um, you stay true to I believe it's a calling. I don't, I, I don't really have another way of of of, of naming it, because some of the stuff that just that I make, it's like, how did I get here? Like, what 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 was I? Some people think, what what did you take? Like, was some kind of drug? I don't do drugs, but it's just sometimes it's just I just just come. I think I don't know. Maybe it's because of watched a lot of TV, you know, recreating movies in my head when I was a teenager. Maybe now it's actually paying back. <laughs> so it feels like a, it's, it's, a, it's a space where you, know, you, you have to be called. Like, I don't know if I can answer the question. Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. There's a list here. Nadine, Kata, Pamela, and Slendile. And then you're going to take one last question after that. Is there any hand? Is there any hand? Where? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I can't see who is this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So after, after Slendy later. Oh, so I just wanted to start anecdotally by mentioning that my father is from Barberton. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I also have all those childhood memories. What's, what, what's your surname? Moon Ah. <laughs> 
but I guess on the Indian side of God, which yeah. so was another enclave. No, I thought you were going to say Patels because my mom used to work for the Patel family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were school teachers. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's 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 leaning into my question from your previous response. Um, that I think maybe artists don't articulate, um, well, maybe not consciously don't articulate their practice in spiritual terms, but maybe do you explicitly see it as a spiritual practice? And if so, do you build any kind of ritual, however mundane it may look? For some people, it's maybe making a copy before you get into the zone or flow. Or not? It's actually my head is all over the place. <laughs> um, I think that's how I. That's how I can actually manage to make a dog in the, in the morning, and at some point I'll stop, and then make a a vulture. And at some point I'll stop, um, like get into my small sculptures. So I, I like working with a, a, a what ADD head. It, it works for me in the studio because just it means that my my hands can be all over the place. So there's no really like a structure. The structure is I I, I am in the studio. <laughs> so every day except for Saturday and Sundays. Okay. Thank you very much for this. It's so beautiful. Um for me honestly this is I, I see this, but this is the first time I've had experience to hear somebody speak of their work in visual arts. And I'm just going back to your experience growing up where you said you didn't have, you didn't, there was no examples for you. So you feel like this just came to you. So my question then is, do you, do you, do you mentor girls? Do you, do, is the, what, what do you do in spaces where other girls, other women, yeah. other people do not have such experiences? Because I'm pretty sure they will call you for some of these thoughts and things like that. So how do you help to build that community of people that want to do work like this, but they don't have the, they don't have the, their, uh, um, what's, what's the word? They don't have the, the one that's lost in my head. The person to look up to or an image of it. So everything is in their head. But yeah. now that with the internet and everything, we have access to so much more things. So what is your contribution to that space? More like more or less like your corporate social responsibility. Yeah. Um, actually, my partner and I have this mentorship program. Um, Making to, his name first. Oh, Lawrence Limawana is my partner, um, who's a great conceptual artist. If you have time, Google him. Yeah. Um, 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 so yeah, we have a young artist. Um, actually, right now, um, we had an opening yesterday um, at Key Art Miles in Joburg. So the idea is um, Mary and Mary Siban and Loris Limawana occupying space. Mm -hmm. So we open up a gallery and we have these young um, artists that we've been mentoring for the last year. They're actually working in the space. And then um, at the end of the, the, the two months, because we're going to occupy the space for two months, they're going to have an exhibition. So for me, for us, it's just um, getting, 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 getting their work out there. And also um, they have to practice how to be in a gallery, how to be in the space. So then from there, the sky is the limit. Look at Nebuchadnezzar, um, who's actually doing amazing right now. Um, a few years ago, we worked together. I was mentoring, mentoring her. And then now she's actually a superstar. <laughs> So, um, so my studio is always open. It's just that I also notice with other, 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 other young artists, they just want to rub shoulders with well-known oh, artists. Yeah. So that's where the danger is. Oh, um, <laughs> and, yeah, and, and, and you can actually tell at some point you can see that this person just wanted to hang out with me, which is fine, mm -hmm. but don't disguise it in a, cause my student, mm -hmm. you, like I always have people coming around just to see what I'm doing. Oh, yeah. And at some point it was just like, no, don't. But now I feel like, you know, the more you get older, I feel like you're a big sister. Yeah. Okay, we want to get everyone in to see. Maybe they'll see what you're seeing, and then they can actually yeah. be greater than, than you know, than me, which is always the bigger class. Oh. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, Kumla, then Sundile, and then uh, Nim. 
So Mary, you created this this life and the spectacular success, spectacular in the best ways, not in the problematic yeah. way, <laughs> spectacular success. And and then Dean asked you about your routine. I'm interested in what, where is the joy? Where is the most joy? What are you, what is the place that you're happiest mm -hmm. in, 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 in relation to, into, in relation to the life that you've created, this big, fantastic art life yeah. that you, that you've created? What makes you, what gives you joy? What is the, where's the joy? What, what makes you happy? Mm -hmm. I'm not your son. Yeah, I, mean, no, I, 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 I get it. Yeah. I know your partner makes you happy, but, <laughs> but what is the what is the where is the joy for you? Um, I think for me is I have been given a space to be great, and I oh I don't take that for granted. Mm -hmm. um, the joy is also coming up with an idea and just seeing it come to life. Mm -hmm. um, and also the joy is just making stuff in the studio where, um, where I am able to do so. So I always cherish those kind of moments because I know a lot of artists who practice before me, they died poor, mm. cold in their studios with no one looking at their work. And right now people are making money out of, out of, out of their artwork. So I'm always grateful that I actually I can, I'm able to pay school fees right now while I'm still can. And um, yeah, I think what, what really makes me happy is thinking of an idea. I'm like, oh, this is so amazing. And of course my partner and I were both visual artists so when I think about this, and I, and usually he would be like, nah, I don't see it, nah. <laughs> because for him, um, he does, like no material is good enough to capture the ideas that he has on his head. And um, to a point where his work looks so simple, but it's so layered. Um, so yeah, we always play this ping pong game <coughs> of ideas. <laughs> Hi, Mary. Hi. I want to go back to the what Shalene spoke about in terms of like value of artist time, value of an artist process. <laughs> because we all know the visual art space is a big medium. It's a big one. Medium worldwide. Yeah. Um, when you began to where you are now, um, and thinking about your negotiation with galleries, <laughs> thinking about trusting a curator, how to um, obviously formulate your process in a gallery or places in the gallery. Um, I saw you in the essay art time, and do you know that your image was used for the content page? How do you feel about that? Yeah. How do you feel about the reappropriating of your work without anyone asking you for your copyright or if you give consent for it? And I wanted to know in terms of like pricing, because I'm going into the art gallery space and I started to realize it's so exploitive, similar to the creative mm. space. Mm. Because people don't really understand that artworks and process and making takes a lot of time. Yeah. Mm. And a lot of money. And a lot of money. Mm -hmm. 120,000 rand for the course. But then, how do you get your money back when a gallery wants 50%? Mm. Jeez, that's a thing. So, um, whew, I've worked with a gallery that it didn't end well because of this same thing where now the work is sold, payment not coming. Um, but um, he's been doing that for years, with, or doing that yes. to, to artists for years. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just all about protecting yourself. Now, how do you protect yourself from vouchers like that? Mm -hmm. um, I think <coughs> is might sound twisted, creating a need to be needed. Mm -hmm. Like you, <laughs> now I'm letting out the secret. Um, <laughs> you, you have to make them think that they can't survive without you, but actually they can. Um, they also do the same thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. like, you, you know, you won't be able to make work without, without our financial support. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's you always, it's like this back and forth, push and pull. You always have to just always be here, always knowing additions. If you have, a, if you're making work that has molds, 
yeah. always make sure that the molds are in your studio because yeah. when you mm -hmm. when you as an artist when you die people will just come and just take mm -hmm. and take but if it's in your studio then you know it's all protect uh, protected in there but also you can't let that be the, the, the thing that you think of because mm -hmm. you'll end up not making work mm -hmm. there are works right now that i don't have the, my previous gallery still keeping them because he can and um, tried lawyers, it just didn't work, but that's another story for another day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, your work is so visceral and so physical, so I was wondering what draws you to sculpture as your medium? Yeah, it's funny because I measured in painting. I got a <laughs> distinction in painting. Um, but after fourth year it made sense that it made sense for me to make um sculptural work in that I was talking about an invincible woman mm -hmm. and that was the domestic worker I didn't want to paint her. I wanted her to be physically in the space mm -hmm. and at some point um I thought of using my grandmother and I was like, no, I can't do that. These women have been working for centuries mm -hmm. and I didn't want them to work any longer. So hence me being the domestic worker. Um, so it made sense that um, she was three dimensional, 3D in the space where you can walk around her and feel her presence. Because mm -hmm. if, it, if, if it was a painting, she would have been lost in the wall. Mm -hmm. So that was one of, well, one, of, one of the many reasons. And I also realized <coughs> that actually, I was actually not so bad when it, comes, when it came to sculpting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Final question. <coughs> Final question. Are we all hungry? Final question. So, Mara, if you were looking at human gallery, because I think a lot of the time there's this illusion that mm -hmm. if you were not the institution, which is a gallery, um, how are you going to move your work? And I was wondering like, whether <coughs> are you at a point where your studio actually, like, you, there's a system in place for you which mm -hmm. allows you just to marry somebody with a brand, uh, works for you, you know, mm -hmm. when you are able to. Um, you have people who are doing stuff, you know, that you have to own how the, the gallery always like come take the work when it's finished. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a process for you where um Mary has the own space function. Um I'm slowly getting to the so how William Kentridge um uh, studio setup is mm -hmm. He makes the work and then gives it to the gallery because mm -hmm. he's funding the work. He's putting money into the production. Um, so what I'm also moving towards that route in that um, he tells the gallery that come and take this. It's not the other way around because usually galleries will tell you, don't make that work, make, make this work. Mm -hmm. So um, it's... Yeah, it's just about knowing um, and just working around that system. And I have a lot of assistants. I have a studio manager. <coughs> I can't, I'm always drowning in, in um, otherwise I'll drown in um, admin. I have a seamstress who's assisting with the, who's making all these dresses. I have a foundry who's making, if I want to make um, stained glass window or voucher, whatever, they do that. Um, so yeah, there is a system that's just, you know, that makes the studio being a studio. Mm -hmm. So it's not only, you know, me. Mm -hmm. So there's other, 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 other people that are, um, that are, um, assisting and work, working with me, which is always great and amazing. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Mary, for accepting our invitation. Um, and just the very sincere and open ways in which you, you discuss art production. Because, you know, one of the things about art in our mind is remo removing that sort of mystifying white male genius trope that we've inherited, mm -hmm. um, which has very little to do with the kinds of everyday labors we're involved in, um, and also the joys as well. Um, so thank you for filling, for filling this stream. Um, so I, I want to end with a confession. May, when you first came out and I saw your work, I was like, I don't, I, I, I'm not really sure this is going to go anywhere. 
And I'm saying this because it's so great when people and life tells you, shh, just because you have a degree, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the difference between sort of wisdom and being an intellectual, because mm -hmm. uh, you just don't know everything. And it's wonderful to see how the incredible journey that you've, you've, you've gone on and that you've taken us all on mm -hmm. uh, with you. So I, I'm very honored that you accepted this. Um, thank you to, to my co-hosts, Landiwe and Nono, um, for the research, and Chloe as well, for the research that has been done, for, the, for, for gathering the questions together. Um, I am not, by the way, an art historian, as uh, Pumla and Mary has said. I'm a visual artist who tries to uh, complicate histories that we've inherited. <laughs> now I know. <laughs> I'll put it correct now. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I, I have a problem with those art historians myself. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and of course, uh, uh, the Art in Our Mind is uh, an archival project. So please go and visit some of um, the, go and visit the archive because we have some fantastic, uh, you know, discussion with on creative theorization with the likes of Pamela Gola and Betty Govindan, Lili Kajawadana and Yvette Abrams. Um, also talks with curators like Mamusa Makubu um, and Same Mbuli with Zodwa Tutani um, and Mamusa Nkululeku. Mabasa, thank you. Nkuli uh, Mabasa. Um, so, so uh, you know, the, uh, with filmmaker Shelley Barry, uh, with um, uh, theater practitioner uh, Mamela Nyamza, and these are, I mean, watching them, it's just, it's completely inspirational. So thank you all very much for staying this late. Um, and yeah, cocktail dinner time. Yay. <laughs>